All right, Molly, second question is, can you please discuss the arguments for putting the book of Daniel into early and into late? <laughs> yeah, this this is this is a long and convoluted subject. Um, I would, you know, I'll, I'll just start off. Let, let's just talk about why why the debate is even a debate. In other words, how how it originated. I'm going to I'm going to actually use. Uh, Stephen Miller's Daniel commentary. It, it, this is in the New American Commentary series, uh, and this whole series is pretty conservative theologically. So it it it, it gives, you know, it, it gives the early date, you know, a fair shake here, rather than just uh, dismissing it. And, and in fact, you know, I think d- defends it reasonably. For, and for the sake of the discussion, the early date of Daniel is is the one that would say that the book was written. In the sixth century BC, that is during the Babylonian period, uh, during the events which are actually described, the historical context that's actually described in the book of Daniel. The late date of Daniel is centuries later, the second century BC. So, you know, roughly 400 years later. Now, you say, well, how, how did we even get to there being a debate? Well, Miller says this. He says, traditionally, it has, it has been held that Daniel wrote the book substantially as it exists today, that the prophecy is historically reliable, and that its predictions are supernatural and accurate. Likely, there was some modernization of the language as the work was copied throughout the centuries, but otherwise it originated with the prophet in the 6th century BC. In modern times, many scholars have maintained that the book in its present form was produced, and that's an important word, composed, produced, by an anonymous Jew during the 2nd century BC, writing under the pseudonym Daniel, and that it consists of non-historical accounts and pseudo-prophecies. The purpose of the work in this scenario was to encourage Jewish believers in their struggle against the tyrant Antiochus the Fourth, also known as Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived from 175 to 163 BC. In other words, during the Maccabean period in Jewish history between the Testaments. Now, this supposition, Miller continues, may be called the Maccabean thesis or hypothesis. According to this view, the book of Daniel would be the latest of the Old Testament scriptures. Often scholars who accept the Maccabean thesis identify the second century writer as a member of the religious sect known as the Hasidim. Now, one more section from Miller. For almost 1,800 years, the traditional view, that is the early view, went virtually unchallenged within both Judaism and Christianity. Porphyry, who's, who basically can be dated to the, the, uh, the 200s, let's just, the, the, the date, that's given in Miller, you know, but again, it's debated, but 232 to 303 AD, again, somewhere in that range. I don't know how precise we can actually be, but Porphyry was an exception to this. Eisfeld, who's a German biblical scholar, explains, quote, the Neoplatonist Porphyry in the 12th book of his polemical work entitled Against the Christians, unquote, indicated the 2nd century BC as the actual date of the book's composition and described the greater part of its prophecies as Vaticinia ex eventu, that is, it's Latin for prophecies or predictions made after the event. His polemic against the Christians has been lost. In other words, it's a document that we can't go read now. It has been lost, but its argument is preserved in Jerome's commentary on Daniel. Uh, Jerome is the guy who created the, the Vulgate, translated the Bible into Latin. Porphyry reasoned from the a priori assumption that there could be no predictive element in prophecy. According to Jerome, Porphyry claims that the person who composed the book under the name of Daniel made it all up in order to revive the hopes of his countrymen, not that he was able to foreknow all of future history, but rather he records events that had already taken place. Again, that's the end of, of Miller's quote, and of course he quotes other other people within that. Porphyry's view ultimately was condemned by the church. Uh, nobody really bought it, but that view now has become kind of, you know, a, a focal point, at least a touch point for the late view of Daniel. Now, I, I should point out that there are evangelicals who take the late view of Daniel and don't talk about Daniel the way that Porphyry did. In other words, they they don't dismiss the idea that. Yeah, prophets really can foretell the future and that God instructs them to do so in, in a number of occasions. They they view Daniel, though, 
as, again, having this after the fact idea, because it is a known genre in the Second Temple period. So there are a number of reasons why they would look at Daniel that way and not at another prophet and his predictions the same way. So it, it, it's not – we can't just call somebody who takes a late view of Daniel as a Porphyrian, if that's even a word. Uh, that, that would be an unfair criticism. It might apply, but it, it, it could be very unfair. So having said, said that, let's just summarize again some of the issues. I think this is really what the, the question was after. So a late date argument – would be made uh, as follows. It's not simply about rejecting the idea of predictive prophecy. Scholars who accept the idea that God can reveal the future to people, but who still take a late, uh, late date view of Daniel, would, ar- would argue the point on the basis of the, f- of the following ideas. Number one, much of Daniel 9 through 11 does, in fact, fit the Maccabean period. Pretty closely, in fact. Only later material in Daniel, roughly from Daniel 11.36 onward, doesn't really jive well with historical events in the Maccabean period. Uh, Most late-date advocates would say Daniel made errors here, but evangelicals who take the late date would speculate that, well, after verse 36, we have some predictive prophecy going on. Most evangelicals who would take the late date of, of Daniel would, would be more generous than critics who'd say, well, Daniel just screwed it up after verse 36. Of course, if you take the early date, you're saying, well, Daniel predicted it all anyway. But that still doesn't answer you know, the, the fact that after verse 36, we have historical problems. But if you take an early date, you'd say, well, when we hit verse 36, that's talking about events in the, in the distant future. So late date evangelicals, many of them, I would say, to be fair, most of them, would say the same thing once you hit verse 36. So that, that was item number one. Item number two, uh, you can argue the late date based on the fact that there are features of late Aramaic in the book of Daniel. Now, Aramaic's like any other language, like English. It goes through stages. Those stages are discernible. What an Aramaic writer would have done in the 6th century you know, is going to differ from what he might do grammatically centuries later. And Daniel does have elements of late Aramaic in it. That's just that's just a fact. It's just the way it is. Third, the presence of Persian and Greek words, which would both be later than the Babylonian period that the book itself describes, is an argument for a late date. In terms of Greek, I'm going to I'm going to bring in Gleason and Archer here. Uh, I think Archer has a, a pretty good treatment uh, of this issue, and he borrows a lot from an old scholar, uh, Robert Dick Wilson, who was an old Princeton scholar, kind of a sort of a personal hero of mine very early in my education. But uh, Archer says this, these three words in Daniel 3, 5 that are are Greek, they're they're kitharis, salterion, and symphonia. These are definitely Greek words. The last of these three does not occur in existing Greek literature until the time of Plato, which is 370 BC, at least in the sense of a musical instrument. From this, it has been argued that the word itself must be as late as the 4th century in Greek usage. But the fact is, you've got three Greek words here that, that on the surface shouldn't be there if the book was written in the 6th century BC, or at least that's the way the argument goes. Fourth item, Daniel in the Hebrew canon. Okay, The Hebrew canon has its own ordering of Old Testament books, and it's different than what you get in your English Bible. In the Hebrew canon, Daniel is not placed among the prophets. It's placed in the last section of the Hebrew Bible known as the writings, and there's a lot of late material in the writings. Five, the Jewish writer Ben Sira, who lived circa 180 BC, in his writings, in, in the reference here is Sirach 40, chapters 44 through 50. He's listing significant Israelite or biblical characters in these chapters, and he fails to mention Daniel, although he does mention Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and collectively the 12 minor prophets. So some reason from that that Ben Sira didn't know Daniel because Daniel didn't exist yet as a book. Sixth, scholars often fo- fixate on the word Chaldean which they say is, is, is late and, again, shouldn't be there if Daniel was written in the 6th century. And then lastly, the seventh sort of trajectory here is that Daniel is very obviously in the apocalyptic literature, literature genre, which 
if you're just sort of counting genre noses, in other words, the number of ancient books that have apocalyptic features, and you say, what are apocalyptic features? You have angels coming and, and talking to people specifically about the future. You've got sort of cosmic imagery about heaven and hell in the future, you know, impending disaster, the ultimate afterlife, day of the Lord kind of stuff. But again, associated with angels specifically, and, and again, the, the way they, they come and dispense messages, those, those are sort of classic stock elements of apocalyptic literature. Think of the book of Revelation. Most of the content of Revelation is mediated through angels. Okay, So that kind of literature, if you're just counting the number of books that, that would sort of have those features, as opposed to the ones who don't, overwhelmingly, I mean overwhelmingly, that kind of literature is dated from the, the third century BC onward. So it would be late. So that, that's how you would argue a late date for the book of Daniel, regardless of, of the prophecy issue. Now, what about an early date? How would the early date argue its position and defend itself among, you know, against some of these other things? Well, here's how it would be done. Events in the book are set in the 6th century BC, and they're very consistent with known historical figures, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and also events, the exile of the Jews to Babylon. In fact, the book gives us a date, you know, that about the exile, and so that's when the book is set, and there's no reason to think that it shouldn't be you know, situated in terms of its composition in that period. Uh, so you have that. Daniel 1.1 1, 1 again gives you an exact date. So why, why not just accept that? Number three, Daniel also has features of early Aramaic. Yes, it does have features of late Aramaic, <laughs> but it also has clear features of early Aramaic. Now, late daters would say, well, that's because the guy who was writing late wanted to give the book the feel of antiquity. So he's living after the fact, and he would just sort of throw in some of this late grammatical stuff to give the reader of, of the original language, again, the, this, this feel of antiquity for the book. And that, that's how they would counteract that. But the, the fact of the matter is, in terms of its Aramaic portions, you have features of both early and late Aramaic in there. Number four, they would say, well, in regard to Ben Sira's list, yeah, it's a long list. I mean, it spans five or six chapters, but it is still selective if you actually read it. In other words, Ben Sira doesn't mention everybody he could mention in terms of a noble biblical character in those chapters. So it's not a big deal that Daniel's not there. He just got skipped for whatever reason. Fifth, Daniel's placement in the canon you know, in the late portion, in the portion of the writings and not the prophets, the early date would say, early daters would say that's due to his primary role of a government administrator in Babylon and not as a classical prophet like the other guys. So they would say, look, the fact that it's placed in the writings just sort of situates it historically because the other stuff in the writings, a lot of it, you know, can certainly has this sort of orientation, Babylonian, Persian empire kind of stuff. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the writings, you know, maybe some of your favorite books, you know, are going to be in there like Job. And you've always heard that Job is early. Well, that, you know, that, that's one of those things. We, we could do an episode on, on that alone. Uh, but there's no guarantee that Job was early. Job has a lot of features of, of late Hebrew. Again, Hebrew's like Aramaic, like English. There's clear stages in the language. There's nothing that necessitates Job being an early book, even though everybody's always taught that. Well, there's no reference to the covenants or the law. Well, maybe they're just not part of the storyline. I mean, that's not a really good argument. Uh, well, they're doing patriarchal stuff. Yeah, well, Job, again, is from the land of Uz, which isn't in Canaan. I mean, this is a Transjordanian situation. So why would we think that they're doing theocratic stuff associated with Moses and the temple? They don't live there. Again, there, there's no reason specifically that you have to take Job early. So if you look at the at the collection of the writings, the late stuff, you're going to say, well, this this order doesn't make any sense. This other stuff isn't late. Well, again, it, it, it may be, but early daters would say, well, Daniel winds up there because of, you know, what the book describes, its setting and his role as an administrator in Babylon and not as a classical prophet in, you know, the promised land proper like the other prophets were. So again, that, that's the counter argument. Number six, uh, Herodotus. This is this is in regard to the the term Chaldean. Uh, Herodotus, writing in 450 BC, uses Chaldean as a term. You say, well, that's still later than the sixth century. It is. 
But there are Assyrian records that go well before the Babylonian period that mention the Kaldu, okay, in cuneiform inscriptions. And the, the Kaldu uh, were, were, again, prominent officials uh, in, in the bureaucracy. So R.K. Harrison's introduction in the Old Testament points that out. Robert Dick Wilson pointed it out uh, in, in his work at, at the turn of the century, uh, turn of the 20th century. Um, again, it, the Chaldean argument really isn't that good of an argument for a, a late date, but you'll still see it. Seventh, what about, what about those Greek words? Well, I'll, I'll just I'll reference you to Archer here again, a little, little paragraph. Archer writes, we now possess less than one-tenth of the significant Greek literature of the classical period, and so we lack sufficient data for timing the precise origin of any particular word or usage in the development of the Greek vocabulary. I think that's a fair point. It should carefully be observed that these three words, again, that, that are in Daniel, are names of musical instruments, and that such names have always circulated beyond national boundaries as the instrument themselves, instruments themselves have become available to the foreign market. These three were undoubtedly of Greek origin and circulated with their Greek names in Near Eastern markets, just as foreign musical instruments and musical terms have made their way into our own language, like the Italian word piano and viola. That's the end of his quote. Now, what Archer's saying here is, look, since these objects, they're all, these Greek terms are all about objects, musical instruments, just because they don't occur in literature doesn't mean that someone in the ancient Near East had never encountered one of these instruments or the persons or you know, person or persons who played them, who would have told them what the thing was called. So in, 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 the, in the course of just cultural interaction, maybe through trade or shipping or you know, who knows how, how, people would have carried these things you know, from Greece into the ancient Near East and people in the ancient Near East would have you know, encountered them in return. And, you know, I've heard them played and said, hey, what is that thing you're playing over there? And then they would have heard, heard the term. And the term could have wound up in foreign discourse, just like piano and viola do in English. Uh, they, they could have wound up in foreign discourse without ever actually being described in literature. Again, that, to me, that's a fair point. You, you could see how that could happen with, with objects of this nature. Lastly, what about apocalyptic, the genre issue? Well, this is one I think that, that the late daters really sort of overhype. Uh, and I, I'm not going to say it's not important. It is important, and, and there is an obvious mass of ap apocalyptic material that's late. That's all true. They're not making that up. But apocalypticism begins in Mesopotamian literature. And the best source of this, and it's dense reading, and it's really, really hard to find. Okay, It took me years to find this book. That is by Helga, H-E-L-G-E, Kvanvig, K-V-A-N-V-I-G. The book is called The Roots of Apocalyptic, subtitle, The Mesopotamian Background of the Enoch Figure and of the Son of Man. Now, we all know from the content of this podcast that Second Temple Jewish material has deep Mesopotamian roots. And so the point here is that apocalypticism, has deep Mesopotamian roots. This is not a 3rd century BC invention. Now, if Daniel is living in Mesopotamia, Babylon, the chances are reasonable that he could have encountered apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic stuff, okay, or that, or that what he is writing about the future, again, would have had some of these stock elements in it, just literarily. This is how you would write this kind of literature. And so Daniel is literate. He's well-trained. We know this from the book of Daniel. He's trained in all you know, the, the skills and the sciences and the knowledge of you know, his, his captors. So if he's used to having a certain set of ideas conveyed with certain literary conventions, if, if that's what he's been educated in, it's not unreasonable to expect that his own material would have followed course would have followed the mold, because that happens everywhere in the Bible. People write things using the literary conventions of how things are written, because if you don't follow them, you look like a hack. You look like you don't know what you're doing. You don't look like a professional writer, is the point. So the apocalyptic argument is, I mean, it, it's legit, but it's not as powerful as, as you think. I mean, there, there is 
there is reason for debate here, but it's not a completely one-sided debate is my point. So there, there you go. This, that's how the early view and the late view would be defended. And I'll, I'll wrap up just by saying this. No, another quote here from, I don't know if I can even pronounce this guy's name correctly. He, his name is in, his first name is in bad need of a vowel here. You know, let me buy a vowel. It's Z-D-R-A-V-K-O. Zdravko Stefanovic. Okay, I, I don't know if I'm really messing that name up or not, but he wrote a, a the volume in the Journal for the Study of the Old Testament Supplemental Series called The Aramaic of Daniel in the Light of Old Aramaic. What he does is he studies old Aramaic inscriptions, and then he compares the grammar and syntax to what you find in Daniel. So he's starting out with certifiably old material, old imperial Aramaic, that sort of stuff. That you would expect in the sixth, you know, seventh, sixth, fifth century uh, BC. And then he compares it to Daniel. Here's what he writes in his conclusion Quote, The contextual discussion of the literary and grammatical features of old Aramaic texts, when brought into contact with Daniel's Aramaic, yields the following results. Number one, the often assumed uniformity of Old Aramaic cannot be maintained any longer, since a study of the grammar of Old Aramaic inscriptions gives a different picture of this aspect of Old Aramaic texts. The Tel Fakhria inscription, with its sizable number of unexpected phenomena, points strongly to this. Okay, number two, this study contributes to the present discussions of Daniel's Aramaic in that it presents answers to certain objections raised regarding the traditional dating of Daniel's Aramaic. Three factors must be accounted for in any conclusion on Daniel's Aramaic. They are geography, chronology, and the literary character of the text. Third, the text of Daniel in Aramaic in its present form, including chapter 7, contains, and here's the payoff, a significant amount of material similar to old Aramaic texts. The key desideratum coming out of this study is that the search for features of Daniel's Aramaic of an early date should be pursued more intensely in the future, unquote. So this is the, the most recent study, it's 1992, most recent you know, book-length study on the Aramaic of Daniel. And basically, basically, he says, you can't date the book by the Aramaic. You just can't do that. It's got as many features of old as it does late. So that ain't working. It's not an argument that really you know, can be used as positive proof for a late view. So that's what I would say in response to the question. I know that was long, but that gives you a rundown on how each side is argued. And, and again, I... You know, I, I understand why why people care about it. Even if you take the late view, when you hit verse thirty six, though, unless you want to just say, "Well, Daniel's a screw up," and there's this thing's full of errors now. If you don't want to say that, you still have to say he's predicting the future. So, in one sense, it is about a theological commitment, even for late daters. And so, I would stress: look, if if you come in, if you run into somebody who takes a late view of Daniel, you got to probe that a little bit with questions. Well, you know, what do you mean? You know, do, do, do you rule out predicted prophecy totally for any portion of the book? And, and do you rule out predicted prophecy totally for the, the whole Old Testament or the whole Bible? I mean, if the answer is yes there, then, then you, you've got someone with a theological bias. But the answer might be no. Okay, and so then, you know, you, you have a different discussion on your hands. So we'll just leave it there.